Hello, and welcome to Mostly Vintage Cameras. This is a Minolta 5000 AF, which was known as a Maxim 5000 in the USA, and an A or Alpha 5000 in the Japanese market. Uh, today I'm just going to run through the basic controls, uh, rather than uh, an in-depth look at where it sat in the Minolta range and what other cameras were available and that sort of thing. So this is more or less a how to use a Minolta 5000 AF video. So let's get into it and let's start as always with the batteries. The batteries sit in this compartment here. It is slotted for a coin, but generally with the knurl finish you can remove it without one, just press and twist. The four AAA batteries that this holds, this is a little articulated function to help me get this tricky last battery in, so we'll put that one in first. Runs on four AAAs, as I say. Uh, and this is the standard battery holder, I don't know if you can read that, it says BH70S. This is what was supplied with the camera. We'll mention some of the accessories that were available as well as we go through this. Uh, and one accessory, one very popular accessory in fact, was the BH70L, which was a long life version of this battery grip, uh, which took double uh, A batteries, I beg your pardon, and extended out and made it a little bit more bulbous when it was on the camera. There was even a uh, low temperature or, or harsh environment battery holder, which was a little box that you put batteries in, and then a, a cable ran from your pocket where that box was situated to the camera, and that was an EP70. Um, all of these things have a 70 suffix, uh, BH70L, BH70S, EP70, because they were all originally made for the 7000, with which the 5000 shares a lot of functionality. So I suppose the next thing will be to look at the lens fitting. Um, this is, press the button here, twist and the lens comes off. Uh, it's what Minolta call a Minolta A series. Uh, and to put it back on again, line the red dots up and twist, all very straightforward. So looking at the top plate, this is where most of the controls are. This particular camera is in a cosmetically pretty poor condition. Uh, and one of the issues with it is the LCD is a little bit damaged here. Quite a few cameras of this age will have damaged LCDs. So we have a power switch. Turn it on. There are two positions to this. There's on. Let me set that little orange marker. Lines up with the word on. And then there's on with a beeper indicator. And we'll leave that on for the moment. It will uh, beep under certain circumstances. So as you can see on the display, it's displaying program exposure, zero frames. So let's go ahead and put a film in here. Film loading is pretty straightforward. All we need to do is push this little button here and slide down and the film back pops open. Just before we put the film in, um, it sounds strange, but I want to have a quick uh, chat about the, the, the film back. This is the standard film back. This is what the camera came with. The only feature really is the um, film inspection window and the little thumb rest. There is, just here, a tiny little screw-headed beaked fixture. Do not use a screwdriver here. It does not unscrew in that way. But if you pull down on that strong loaded pin, the back detaches. And there were, in fact, two alternative backs for this camera. There was a data back 70, which uh, enabled you to print the date or time on your photographs. And then there was a program back 70. And that added features such as an intervalometer. So you could take you know, one picture a minute for 20 minutes, or one picture a second for 100 seconds, or whatever it might be. And it also featured a... Uh, a timed long exposure, so instead of pressing a button and using a stopwatch, you could put into the program back, take a picture for 92 seconds, and, and it would go off and do that automatically. So, uh, again, this entry level camera benefiting from a couple of accessories from uh, uh, the more up 
market brother. And you'll see these little gold pins here. I wear those two accessory camera backs uh, synced with the camera. However, for now, we're going to load a film. Um, full suite of GX coding pins. It will run from 25 ASA to, I want to say, 6400. In fact, thinking about it, it's definitely 6400. All you need to do is put the film in the film chamber. What I'm going to do first, actually, is not load the film correctly. And you see it still says zero, and that's all it does say. So that's a problem. I don't know what happens. You know, it attempts to take a picture, but it doesn't actually work. So let's open the camera back again. Pull this out to the correct loading mark, that orange marker there. So the noise of the winding changes, uh, and we can now see there's a little film cassette symbol, there's a little leader symbol, and there's a frame number one. So that uh, is all very standard. Now in program exposure, uh, the camera simply chooses the shutter speed and the aperture for you. Uh, and you might think that's a very basic operation, which of course it is. It is a little bit more sophisticated than you might at first think. If you put a wider angle lens on, uh, focal lengths below 35mm, the camera will bias the exposure towards a smaller aperture and more depth of field. Uh, if you put a standard lens on, it will go for what you might call a standard program, just a straight split between aperture and shutter, shutter speed. And if you put a lens over 105mm on, it... So while the camera doesn't have any manual intervention in the program mode, you don't have program shift as we would call it today, uh, it does sort of have an automatic intelligent program, which is quite cool and often overlooked on this camera. It's not a, not a radical feature, but it's there nonetheless. There is also on the beeper a camera shake warning. So if the shutter speed falls below a certain level, uh, it will go bippity bip and warn you that you might get camera shake. And that is also tied into the focal length of lens. So again, uh, below 35mm, it will beep at a 30th of a second. 35 to 105, it will warn of camera shake at a 60th. And then lenses over 105mm, it will warn of camera shake if the shutter speed falls below 125th. So... A definite step up from the earlier cameras where it was fixed at one value if it had a camera shake warning at all. But um, let's move on. Um, the only other controls really, there is an up and down key here. And there is a duplicate up and down key here. And these work in conjunction with what you might call the advanced features of the camera. If I slide this panel over, um, if we don't have a DX coded film, we can set the ISO manually, press the ISO button, and we can set it on the display there just using the up and down key. And that does also override the um, DX coding. You could, in principle, use that as a poor man's exposure compensation feature. There's also a self timer, very simple, you turn the self timer on, and it will give you a 10 second delay with a countdown and a beeper. There we go. Uh, and then the, the feature that's going to be the most interesting to most people, press that button again and we go into manual exposure. Now in manual exposure, this key becomes your shutter key and these keys on the side become your aperture keys. Um, and the way you would use that is in the viewfinder display. So it's a little tricky to film viewfinder displays, but we'll give it a go. Let's get to the viewfinder camera. So here we're in program mode, and we can see that it says P for program. Uh, it displays the shutter speed and the aperture the camera has chosen. Uh, and on the left, you'll see there's a, a little light that lights up green when the autofocus has achieved focus. Autofocus works in program mode and manual mode, of course. Um, but here I've got it set to program and autofocus. And the little green light comes on and it chirrups. Uh, quite pleasingly when it's achieved focus. If we move now to uh, the manual focus, 
or the manual exposure and manual focus in actual fact. We get a slightly different display. It's now displaying M for manual. It's displaying the shutter speed and the aperture that you as a photographer have selected. And you'll see there's a little up and down arrow. Uh, when the up arrow is displayed, you're overexposing. When the down arrow is displayed, you're underexposing. And when both are displayed, um, you have correct exposure according to the camera. Worth noting, the camera uses a uh, standard centre-weighted average metering. There's no clever evaluative metering on this camera, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but it gives you an e easy indication of, of where you are. Manual focus, you can see there's a little arrow uh, which tells you which way to turn the lens focus ring. And once you've achieved focus, you get a little green spot. And so that's pretty much um, the viewfinder display and how the manual exposure mode works. There's one other feature of this. Let's just turn it, uh, turn the self timer on and set it to manual and we'll mess up the shutter speed. I don't know what setting I'm choosing here and I've got a little bit confused. Maybe I don't really know how to use the camera or I want to lend the camera to somebody who's not used it before. If we slide this cover closed, all of the settings default to the basic program exposure, no self-timer, and nothing else. So if you just give this to somebody with the cover closed and tell them not to tamper with anything, it's basically fully automatic, and there's, there's no, no uh, pushing any buttons will change that. Apart from this button here, which you might be able to see says BLC for backlight compensation. Uh, if you hold this button, press and hold it, it will increase the exposure by plus two stops. So if you have a lot of sky in the scene, for example, or a bride in a bright white wedding dress, the camera will tend to underexpose. So the sky comes out nice, um, but the landscape comes out underexposed. So this will increase your exposure by two stops. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Autofocus. Uh, Two settings for the focus mode. AF is autofocus, M is manual. In manual, it's just the focus ring on the end of the lens. Uh, they're very loose, these uh, typically, but uh, that's okay, they, they work fine in manual. Autofocus, when you have autofocus selected, you get these classic autofocus noises with a little chirrup if you've got the beeper on once it's achieved focus. Uh, it's single point, it will only focus in the centre of the frame, uh, and it's um, a single shot, so if your subject moves once you've achieved focus, you will have to take your finger off the button and press it down again. So if you wanted to autofocus off centre, you would need to press the button halfway down until you've achieved focus, got the green light in the viewfinder, and then recompose your image before you took the picture. And that is pretty much all the functions of the camera. Once you get to the end of the film, um, in fact, let's just whiz through that. You'll see the frame counter counts up um, and it will wind on continuously as long as you keep your finger on the shutter button. It runs at about one and a half frames a second. And at the end, you get a, a warning beep if you've got the beeper on, you get the flashing symbol. And to rewind the film, very simply press this R button here. And at the same time, move that catch over. And you'll see the display will show it's rewinding. When it's got three dots along the bottom there, it's just started. When it's got two dots or lines, it's halfway through. And then one line means it's very close to having finished rewinding. Once it's finished, you just get the, the exposure mode information disappears, the frame number disappears, you just get a film cassette symbol, and you, of course, remove your uh, film. Now, this camera does feature a shutter speed range from 4 seconds to 2,000th of a second. Uh, it does have a bulb mode, 
Now, if you're using it uh, in manual at the slower shutter speeds, you can have it on a tripod, and of course, you can use a self timer to prevent camera shake. Um, however, that's not very convenient. Plus, if you want to use it in bulb, you can't hold the button down uh, whilst the shutter's open or you'll get camera shake. So, just here on the front, that's usually covered by a little plastic cover. Uh, is a port for a remote release. Uh, now, a lot of people tell you there are two remote releases for this, but there were, in actual fact, three. There was the RC1000S, which is a simple button on a stick with a cable. That's 50 centimeters long. The S is for short. And the RC, the remote cord of 1000L, uh, is a 5 meter long cord, so you can really uh, trip the camera from from about to five meters away. So if you wanted to put it in a, a, an awkward position, the camera mounted, you know, way above your head in the ceiling somewhere, you could be up to five meters away. But there was also an IR1N remote infrared uh, remote release for this. It was a box that went on top of the camera on the hot tube. And a separate, uh, like a radio control car uh, shaped device, which again just had a simple button on it, um, and that would trip the shutter from from memory. I believe it was up to 50 meters away. Um, you don't see too many of those IR one end sets because they're quite expensive when they were new, and um, not many people bought them as a consequence. So, uh, in terms of flash units. The Minolta uh, flash system on these cameras is actually very good. There were three flash units for this. They did a tiny little one called an 1800 AF, uh, which was unusual in that it ran on a lithium cell, which in the mid-80s was uh, not at all common. And it was roughly equivalent, you could say, to the sort of built-in flash unit you get on a, a modern camera. Uh, it did feature a small infrared illuminator, so it did help autofocus performance in low light. Uh, the next option, which was by far the most popular, was the uh, Program 2800 AF flash unit. Let me just move this slightly to the side. Um, these pins here, incidentally, are because this can work with another accessory for the camera, which was the Control Grip 1000, CG1000 which was uh, an extended life battery and it was like a right angle bracket but a, a bit posher. It also featured off-camera infrared control which was absolutely groundbreaking at the time. But the 2800 flash unit, um, pretty basic, guide number 28, um, simple on-off switch, test button and there was a low power and a high power selector. Um, if you use low power, obviously you've got faster flash recycling time. That was your kind of default flash unit. But the most interesting one was this guy. Uh, this is a 4000 AF. Um, quite a powerful flash unit, as you'd imagine. And as you can probably tell, it's got a bounce and swivel head. It's also got a zoom head, so if you put a wide angle lens on, it will choose a wider angle flash coverage. You put a longer focal length lens on it, which will choose a narrower flash coverage, or angle of coverage, uh, which extends the range the light will, will travel a little bit. And if you put a zoom lens on, it will zoom from the wide to the tele end as you go from, let's say, 35 to 105. But on the back, we have what, even by today's standards, is a very modern flash unit. I was going to turn the light on if it works, which it does not. Um, this is quite an old piece of kit now, and, and <laughs> as far as I can tell, it's had a hard life. So now we've got um, auto exposure, manual exposure, a variable output level down to, uh, what's that, a 16th output, that's pretty cool, uh, and then back up to full power. Uh, manual zoom as well, if you want to zoom manually. Um, so yeah, just a really nice little TTL manual button here because we're off the camera, it's only going to work in manual. Just a nice little, um, well, nice, quite big actually flashing it, very, very modern. 
Um, this little connector on the side here, there was also a whole range of uh, remote corded. Uh, she didn't want to buy the CG1000 and use it wireless infrared, which was very cutting edge at the time. Uh, you could use a, a more traditional uh, corded system. So that's the, the three flash units that were available for it. And I think that probably uh, completes this roundup of the 5000 AF. These are amazingly inexpensive. Um, I quite like them, and it's big rather than the 7000. These are quite fun. And absolutely cutting edge at the time they came out, although by modern standards, of course, quite basic. Anyway, that has been the Minolta 5000 overview, uh, essentially how to use a Minolta 5000 AF. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and some people may have found it useful. Thank you for watching, I do appreciate it, and do have a good day. All the best.